say it's mostly a kind of coincidence that it happened. I was living in China. I, I was offered my real job as a cameraman. And I was working in China for, for, for years. And um, while working there, my, my kind of home base, my, my social life was revolving around the art scene in Beijing. That was what I knew about Beijing. That was where my, my friends were. That's where I spent my pat, uh, free time. And, and the, the art scene was booming at that time. And I, I thought it, it, was, it was quite crazy what was happening there. And I wanted to do something about that. And one reason I chose to do something about the art scene was that I thought that was, it was not that Chinese. That the scene was very international. The galleries were Western, and a lot of the, the whole scene was so interconnected with the New York, London, or Paris art worlds. And for me, it seemed that this is the Beijing, this is my Beijing, cosmopolitan and a global, globally connected Beijing. I did not want to become another filmmaker from the West commenting on the East. And the irony is that that's exactly what I became in the end. So in the, in the, in the beginning, I was trying to make very different film. I was wanted to make it about the dynamics of the art scene. And I was more interested on the art scene in general rather than particularly in China. And this was my whole point that in the beginning that, that this is it could be New York, it could be London. It just happens to be Beijing that is now booming. And I was following five, six different characters. There was an old artist, very, very successful, which is Wang Guangyi. There was a young graduate, Liu Gang. There, there was an art dealer. There was an art forger. There was an art collector. And there was a museum project in the middle of a desert in Inner Mongolia. And my idea was to paint a kind of kaleidoscope or cut through the whole cultural or well, art scene in, at that point. But as the project evolved, these questions about Eastern and Western influences and what is modern Chinese? What does modernization mean? Is it just copying West? Or is there some connection to their own culture? Or is, is it possible to have another version of modernization? These, these kept surfacing. And I kept putting them back. No, no I don't want to do about China. I want to do something else. But on the other hand, that I finally realized that that's what is really interesting to me. And it's also because I was living in China as a Westerner, as a foreigner. So while these artists are thinking about who they are in, in a global context, I'm also kind of thinking, well, who am what, what does it mean to be Finnish or Scandinavian or European or Westerner in China? Or what, what might be kind of the next, next version of globalization? So this is basically the, roughly the journey how it ended up being what it is. How the structure of the film evolved, that's something very organic or it's, it's molded by the process of making this film. And it reflects, reflects that. It's not like I started, I want to make film with two characters, with three chapters, and it's going to, it, it just, it ends up being that. And it goes through various different, I don't know, negotiations with the material I have. And obviously, it's a kind of a, in the end, it comes down to the kind of dialogue I have with the editor. We, we go different kind of, um, it's basically it's like this, that the editor was very sort of emotionally, he approached the footage very emotionally, or more, let's say more traditionally, looking for the kind of story arcs. And, and I and then approached it, I've been working with this uh, for four years, so I, I had kind of, I've seen the footage and I've seen the story points and the, I've experienced everything already so long that for me it's not new. The, so I approach the material quite analytically maybe or more as a theme, as a thematic sort of uh, thematic ground. 
and I'm, I'm also looking the story in more thematic, where the editor is looking more from the story or traditional point of view. And then we kind of, we kept taking turns that the first version was completely in, intuitive. We just pick up our favorite scenes, favorite story points, and we put them randomly on the, on the, on the wall. And that's our first draft, which is, I don't know, five hours or something. And then we take a more analytical approach. OK, what, what, is, what are the themes? What is, what is the thematic arc rather than story arc or character arc? And the next version is kind of based on that. And then we, again, go more intuitive way. And then it's kind of this kind of interplay that finally ends up being what it is. But the arc, it's, the film is called Chimeras. And Chimera is a kind of a mutant hybrid beast that is maybe not supposed, things that are not, maybe not supposed to be put together as they are, or they not, m might not necessarily belong to each other. So the whole structure is kind of also sort of chimera in, in that way. I mean, in film, we see one film, you obviously kind of uh, you simplify things to a certain extent. So what you see about Wang Guangyi is part of Wang Guangyi, but there's much more complex man or more, more complex image of him, and same with Liu Gang. But I'd say Liu Gang is, is I'm obviously can connect much better with Liu Gang. He's more closer to my generation. He's grown up like me in a world where there is, there China has been open to the world already. He's, like he says himself, he's gro grown in globalized world, like I have grown, and we can share a lot of popular culture, we've seen the same films, same music, we, he knows Michael Jackson, I, I knew Michael Jackson. And I mean, whereas Wang Guangyi, he has grown in a completely different world. He has grown in a completely global, he's gro grown up essentially like people in North Korea grow up now, until a certain point when he was already a an, an young ad adult when China suddenly started to open up. So that's obviously two very, very different backgrounds, two very different worlds. And yet, they're, they're both Chinese. And it's not that big, the, the, the difference in the age. That and um, this is, I think, the main, main sort of uh, difference, or this is where the difference comes in their thinking. Uh, Wang, Wang Guangyi, he's, he, when China opened up, he kind of devoured the Western influences, Western philosophies, Western art, everything from the West that was, because it was suddenly all open to them. And they kind of digested that for, for their own their art or their own thinking. And now he's reached the point, and I'd say m many of his generation, they've reached the point that they kind of they feel kind of a bit lost with, with all, all this, or they be, feel a bit disappointed, maybe, that, that uh, is that it? Or, or they, they're kind of rebelling against their own, own achievements in, in some ways. Yeah, they feel a little bit trapped with, 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 the, with because their contemporary art is, is something that has no, no real connection, no organic connection to Chinese tradition. It's contemporary in relation to modernism, which is, it's, modernism doesn't make any sense from perspective of Chinese art history. It only makes sense from so-called world art history, which is Western art history. So they, 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 they're desperately trying to kind of figure out what, what, what does contemporary mean as a Chinese? It's contemporary in relation to, uh, to Western history. And whereas Liu Gang, he's, he kind of accepts this situation. He sees it more or less as an opportunity in some ways. He, he's aware that he's in this prison, so to speak, or in this trap that there is no connection. But he's, he's kind of cool with it. It just he more like goes with the flow and tries to make best out of it. And, and um, that's, I think, the main difference of their mode of thinking in terms of how these cultural influences can be combined. 